Tonight on Nation and Nation, an assessment of mining's potential impacts on peatlands in Northern Ontario hasn't even started, but a handful of area chiefs say they already aren't being heard. Our people need to be at the forefront when it comes to um, significant massive projects like the Ring of Fire. The loss of three children's lives in a Sandy Lake fire last week is an unimaginable tragedy. First Nations fire prevention expert Blaine Wiggins doesn't want to see it happen again. Taking every fatal fire and turning that, identifying the cause of determination and turning those into safety bulletins and subsequent programs and services. That Ontario is appealing a case to the Supreme Court of Canada over a clause in the 1850 Robinson-Huron Treaty that said if land revenues increased, so would a $4 annuity. They believed the Crown at the time when the Crown said, yes, if we make more revenue in the territory, you will get a share of that. Well, that has not happened. Welcome to Nation to Nation. I'm Brett Forster. Deep beneath the James Bay lowlands in northern Ontario lies a massive deposit of valuable minerals. It's known as the Ring of Fire and companies have been eager to mine it for more than a decade. The provincial government calls it a once-in-a-century opportunity, but it would occur entirely on the territory of Treaty 9 First Nations, and some are concerned about how it's being handled. For more, I'm joined by Attawapiskat Chief David Nakaji and Kasheshawan Chief Gaius Wesley. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brett. Chief Nakaji, let me start with you. The federal government is going ahead with an environmental impact assessment for the entire region. What is it about Ottawa's approach that concerns you? Well, the um, the concern that we have is a is a people that uh, the impact on the, that's going to happen with the Ottawa First Nations that lives down the river of the uh, uh, the, the requested mine site, and uh, not only does uh, Ottawa Piscat members are going to be uh, be impacted environmentally, we live in the uh, region what we call the James Bay and Hudson's Bay uh, basin of the uh, of the, uh, the bay itself so it will impact everyone that's in the uh, James Bay area chief wesley how would you like canada to alter the process to ensure that first nations in the area have their rights and jurisdiction respected well um, what canada and ontario needs to do is uh, they need to throw out the um, draft terms of reference, the um, the um, the draft agreement for the um, the regional assessment ring of fire, and uh, what they need to do is that they need to work with the First Nations people through a um, a collect a through a collect, and um, the co enforced approach to ensure that um, the people in our region also have um, their say in the, in the um, terms of reference. And not only that, because we also want to have our own um, commission, our own um, committee where we can also provide um, the draft terms of reference on how this can work for, um, for, for, for the um, First Nation communities that are affected by the Ring of Fire. Now, I understand a number of leaders met recently with Environment Minister Stephen Guibault to talk about this issue. Chief Nakaji, what was his response when you raised these concerns? Well, we didn't get much of a response. And, uh, you know, uh, you know how governments uh, are when you when you meet them. They want to provide you the answer at that point in time when, when you have a meeting with them. So basically, it's just uh, we, be, we provided our concerns. We voiced our concerns. And um, and there was no answer as to what action is going to be taken by uh, the government. So uh, so that's basically uh, what the uh, what happened in the meeting. So he's going to come back and 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 say what the uh, what the answer is in 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 the near future. And I don't know when that's going to be. Now, on the other side of this particular coin, Premier Doug Ford said somewhat famously now that the Ring of Fire would be mined even if he has to ride the bulldozer himself. Chief Wesley, how has the provincial government responded to your concerns? Um, the um, provincial government, uh, we met with him uh, this past December with Minister Greg Rickford and his um, 
and his um, colleague, Minister of Environment. And um, the, um, we wanted to create a treaty round table we want to uh, we want that treaty round table to discuss on how we can work together to ensure that um, our people's uh, voices their concerns are heard in the ring of fire and um, with the um, Doug Ford's uh, message during his um, campaign is that um, he didn't have any knowledge over the uh, First Nations people um, the um, inherent rights the jurisdictions that we have on our lands that um, that we depend on to survive, especially with the young population that are um, growing. You know, um, it's disappointing. Okay, I've got time for one more uh, brief round of questioning. Uh, Chief Nakaji, there already has been one major mine in the region, the De Beers Victor Gold Mine near Attawapiskat. Uh, how do you feel about more mines given the community's experience there? Well, a lot of people say that the, uh, you know, we had benefited uh, from the uh, Victor, Victor mine itself, but in all reality, and uh, you know, n nothing had accomplished the uh, uh, to uh, help our uh, uh, people. Um, you know, uh, Arwapska never had any uh, uh, the benefit out of it, and uh, so uh, having said that, yeah, there there was a uh, agreements in place, but unfortunately, you know. Um, this is my first term as a chief here, and I don't see anything that uh, that uh, you know how our community grow uh, or benefited from the mine. Chief Wesley, last word over to you. What options are on the table if the governments refuse to change course? Um, um, the First Nations communities um, that we work with together when. Um, um, Together, that we're proposing these um, proposing these um, steps with the government to work with us is that um, I believe that we will have to go into um, a litigation to ensure that our um, voices are heard, to ensure that our people are um, properly consulted. You know, um, what I believe is that um, because because our um, because the James Bay Lowlands area is one of the second largest peatlands in the world and um, the peatland is one of the and peatlands are one of the um, is one of the largest natural terrestrial carbon stores and it's and it's our um, and it's our natural de defense in our fight against um, climate change you know this, these are the things that we also need to take into consideration if we're going to have um, if we're going to co-develop mm -hmm. or even call it approach to ensure that the um, a proper and a more effective um, regional impact assessment draft terms of reference is being developed. Okay, we have to leave it there. I'd like to thank you both for coming on Nation to Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a discussion about fire safety on First Nations following the tragic house fire in Sandy Lake. Late last week, tragedy struck the remote First Nation of Sandy Lake. Three children died in a house fire, leaving the small northwestern Ontario community grieving. As a result, advocates are renewing long-standing demands for action. To discuss fire safety prevention and response on First Nations, I'm joined by Blaine Wiggins. He is the executive director of the Aboriginal Firefighters Association of Canada. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you for having me. After the fire, Sandy Lake issued a press release that said a, a lack of adequate water lines prevented use of fire hydrants while only one water truck was operational. How common are these sorts of infrastructural challenges across other First Nations? I think it, it would be fair to say that this is a common challenge that we're having right across Canada. Um, you know, with limited capacity, uh, the issues around equipment, uh, the infrastructure, and volunteer departments, um, but I would uh, remiss not to acknowledge, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, you know, the, the community of Sandy Lake and, and, you know, the grieving that they're going through and, and our condolences to them, but also uh, what was not necessarily well reported was uh, how diligent the fire department of Sandy Lake 
uh, committed themselves to that fire and and trying to address and overcome in the moment. So um, big heartfelt uh, um, you know response to to that department and and what they now have to endure uh, with their own community loss. This is a complex subject, certainly, to raise at a trying time, but what are a few of the systemic issues other than infrastructure that contribute to fire risk on First Nations communities? One of the biggest challenges is, uh, is standards that uh, exist within non-First Nations communities, whether it be uh, uh, fire protection acts, uh, whether it be uh, community-based uh, fire services, um, insurance standards that are um, well-established, uh, occupational health and safety standards for fire departments and the communities uh, to address that, that help meet uh, equipment standards within the community. And obviously funding uh, is certainly an ongoing issue with many uh, rural remote communities uh, being largely dependent on uh, federal federal funding and the funding formulas that come with that, and which doesn't necessarily match uh, the existing needs of uh, the departments themselves. So it, it really is, uh, it, it is a long and large range of issues. Uh, you know, and then reaching out into other issues like housing, housing conditions, um, standards which houses are built, inspected, uh, maintained. There, there is, you know, there's certainly pockets of excellence that are happening, but uh, it is in a broad range um, capacity that, that all communities can meet uh, around. And, and just even fire prevention, a standard for fire prevention within communities does not exist right now. And so those are the things that we're working diligently with uh, regional First Nations organizations, Indigenous Services Canada, uh, Canadian Council of Fire Marshals, Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs, Public Safety Canada. Uh, so there's a broad range of, of groups that are that are working uh, to help bring this together. And it certainly won't be one community or one organization that, that provides all of the solutions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned funding a little bit earlier. This House of Commons report found that Canada had chronically underfunded emergency response in First Nations. To what extent could adequate funding help solve some of these problems? I think it would be significant, and, and really it is on a community-by-community community basis, and, and that's, you know, uh, again, you know, we work in a, a federal system where, you know, it's a one-size-fits-all, especially around uh, funding formulas, uh, and what we need to do is identify what the community capacity is and adapt both the funding and the support services for that community's needs. Uh, and we have, uh, like I said, we have excellent examples within communities that exist now, and it's about sharing those stories and what they are doing well and, and I'll just use a small example uh, uh, for a community to uh, adopt a fire bylaw and uh, have that enforceable in the way the community needs to enforce it to ensure fire safety that is a huge step forward and it starts to bring in alignment between compar comparisons so where a, a local fire bylaw can actually incorporate the same components that a provincial or territorial fire bylaw has uh, around yeah, safety standards within a home adopting uh, the requirement for having smoke alarm in the home, working smoke alarms and tested smoke alarms. Yes, the Ontario coroner investigated this and delivered a similar report last year. It described something called jurisdictional neglect, which is where uh, many reserves can fall through the cracks because governments don't cooperate. So where do provincial governments factor into this debate? Uh, so provincial governments have been, uh, as I uh, articulated, the Canadian Council of Fire Marshals, which uh, makes up uh, all the provincial territorial fire marshals and the Department of National Defense fire marshal have been very cooperative and collaborative in sharing their expertise, uh, giving access to training, uh, sharing standards, uh, incorporating uh, First Nations communities into much larger larger discussions and, and responses like wildfire and, and interface fires. So I think there's been a very collaborative approach. And again, we've seen uh, that relationship and that better understanding from um, uh, provincial governments uh, through their fire marshal's office, a uh, much better understanding of the challenges that we're facing. And, uh, you know, another example of that is of sharing uh, fire incident reporting. So we have a better idea uh, of the fires that are happening and what the cause of determinations are those. So then again, we can go back and keep on that evolution of adapting programs to respond to what we see as the trends that, that start to emerge. Uh, one of the things that we've also started doing 
uh, within uh, AFAC and National Indigenous Fire Safety Council is, is taking every fatal fire and turning that, identifying the cause of determination and turning those into safety bulletins and subsequent programs and services that, that will address those specific causes. What we do need though is a much more robust reporting system where the communities are voluntarily reporting instances so we can see not just the ones that are causing catastrophic events uh, like loss of life and, and uh, injuries and major loss of property infrastructure, but the, the fires that are the small fires that could have caused those same things. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the, the current gaps that, that uh, provincial uh, entities and, and provincial governments are working with us on. Okay, Mr. Wiggins, there's certainly a lot to do. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this segment, but I do want to thank you for your time this evening. No, thank you, and we encourage everybody, um, First Nations, non-First Nations, working smoke alarms is your first line of defense. In other news, Ontario is taking a legal fight over treaty annuities to the country's top court. We'll have that after a short break. Welcome back. The Ontario government continues to fight a losing battle over treaty annuities in the Upper Great Lakes. In 2018, a judge ordered the Crown to raise the annual payment from $4 per person. That's where it's been stuck since 1875, even though the treaty said it must go up if the territory starts to generate more wealth. The appeal court upheld the ruling last month. The federal Liberals have agreed to negotiate with 21 Anishinaabe communities that receive the payment. But now the province is taking the fight to the Supreme Court. Mike Restool is the chair of the Robinson Huron Treaty Litigation Fund. He joins me from one of those communities, Nipissing First Nation. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brett. So why hasn't this payment been raised in nearly 150 years? It is clear to me that Ontario does not want to pay. They would prefer that the federal government pay, and therein lies the difficulty. We are trying to get the parties to a table to negotiate a, a settlement on this, because in our view, reconciliation means the parties agree to a settlement. You cannot achieve that in a court of law. So what was your reaction when you learned Ontario had once again appealed this case? I was completely disappointed because to me, what happens here is that the Ontario government wants to put us in a position where we were before the treaty was signed in 1850. In other words, the British Crown if we can call it that today, is fully in charge of the things that happen to us. And they want to continue it in that manner. In our view, if the, if the Crown is fully responsible at their discretion to increase the annuity, we'll never get an increase in the annuity because their priorities are not us. So therefore, um, in my view, the, the action by the Ontario government to go to the Supreme Court is very regressive. Well, on that note, why do you think Canada has decided to take a different tack and negotiate rather than litigate? I believe that uh, the, the uh, federal liberals are more, um, more opt, uh, apt rather to... Um, to uh, work toward reconciliation with the First Nations. I don't believe the Ontario Conservatives have that same attitude toward First Nations. What exactly are the Anishinaabek communities who launched this case hoping to achieve in the end? We are hoping to achieve fairness and justice. First of all, fairness means because the treaty said we would get a share of that revenue that is generated in our territory, we have not, uh, in, since 1874, uh, received a fair share of that uh, 
of that revenue. I say fair share, but perhaps it's not a fair share. It's something that we have to come to agreement on. And uh, I think that if, if, we can, if we can do that, this case would be settled before too long. And what would it mean for the communities to finally get access to this fair share of the revenue stream, as you just put it? You know, the leaders, the uh, Anishinaabeg leaders in 1850 knew that the revenue from the land could support their communities. And that's what they relied on with the Crown. They believed the Crown at the time when the Crown said, yes, if we make more revenue in the territory, you will get a share of that. Well, that has not happened. If we get that share of the revenue on an ongoing basis, as the treaty outlines, our communities would fare much, much better than living in poverty mm -hmm. uh, in our First Nations. The Ontario Superior Court rulings and the Appeal Court ruling uh, were quite firm and persuasive in your favor. If the Supreme Court comes down decisively again in your favor, do you think that would finally get Ontario to the table? I just wonder if the Supreme Court of Canada would uh, identify an amount of compensation and a process to move forward into the future on the treaty. I would think that the Supreme Court of Canada is more likely to uh, uh, tell the parties to get to the table and negotiate a settlement on this, a settlement for retroactive uh, losses and for a process to move forward into the future based on revenue from the territory. And finally, I know it's hard to speculate, but how might this ruling, if it does eventually stand, impact other treaty First Nations who get similar annuities? It's difficult to, to say that, you know, because uh, the Robinson Huron Treaty and the, the Robinson Superior Treaty as well have that uh, augmentation clause, we call it, that says that if the, uh, if the territory gains more revenue for the crown, uh, that the, the, uh, aug and that the uh, annuity will be augmented. I don't believe there, are, there are, are any treaties in Canada other than ours that have that augmentation clause. However, other treaties have annuities uh, identified in their treaties. And uh, perhaps uh, fairness on their side, uh, on uh, you know, would uh, allow them an increase in the uh, in their revenues as well in their uh, annuity revenues. So I think that it, it would it might have some impact on other treaties. All right, Mr. Restul, we'll have to leave it there for now. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me into your show, Brett. And that wraps up tonight's episode of Nation to Nation. As always, if you missed any part of tonight's show or wish to check out past episodes, head online to aptnnews.ca slash nation to nation. I'm Brett Forster, and thanks for watching.